we don't get too many of those, so uh, by the time we leave, there will be dark, so we'll enter it. A great pleasure to introduce this week's um, uh, speaker, Julia Baum. Um, some of you may know, I, I usually sort of uh, um, uh, have a hard time thinking of how I'm going to introduce someone, so I want to, you know, convey all the person's contributions to the field. It's like, am I going to do a good job of that? And uh, fortunately, Julia sent me her CV, and she made it so easy. This is my reduced highlight of uh, Julia's CV. It's pretty impressive. Um, usual bio info, um, she received her Bachelor's of Science from McGill, um, then got her Master's and PhD at the Housing in 2002 and 2007, respectively. Um, she, there's my notes. Uh, she was then awarded the prestigious David H. Smith Fellowship, which she did in 2007 to 2009, um, and she just completed that. And then she's just started an NC Fellowship uh, in January, properly. Um, also, I didn't know, in 2008, 2008, she was awarded the Enser Postdoctoral Fellowship and Howard Alper Postdoctoral Prize. And those of you who don't know what the Howard Alper Postdoctoral Prize is awarded to the top postdoctoral researcher in all of Canada. It's not too bad. Um, Julia, uh, a lot of you may be aware of Julia's work, but her work is focused on conservation of sharks um, and has focused on both identifying uh, the patterns of shark populations and also the ecological impacts of removal of sharks. Um, her publication record is, of course, outstanding. She has 14 peer reviewed publications, three in science, one in ecology letters, um, and then the all others are very high quality journals as well. Um, what's that for here? Um, oh, I was going to, I was going to say it's, it's very difficult to overstate uh, Julia's contribution to the field. And I thought I would just sort of end by saying that in 1999, I participated in a workshop that was intended to provide an overview of the status and threats of pelagic shark populations. And it brought together experts from around the world and we were sequestered into this uh, workshop facility for um, five days, all you know, some of the best shark experts around, and we came up with nothing. Um, and Julia and her graduate program basically got paying all of us. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Julia, who's going to talk about in hot water consequences of escalating shark exploitation. Also, please let me know if you can hear me. I'll try and stay somewhat within the vicinity of this mic. Um, it's a real honor uh, to be here at UW. I um, just wanted to visit you guys at SAS for years and years now. Um, and not just because Carl Walters told me to be when I studied at the Fishery Center at UBC, but uh, also because you guys just have such a great uh, and diverse group of scientists uh, working in fields closely related to mine. So it's really exciting for me to be here. And uh, I've had a great day meeting some of you, and I'm looking forward to uh, meeting more at dinner and talking to more of you tomorrow. Well, exploitation, uh, as everyone in this room is well aware, uh, impacts many different species around the world. Um, my own research focuses on trying to understand the impacts of exploitation on marine fishes. And today I'm going to focus on the research that I've done over the past decade, trying to understand the direct impacts of exploitation on shark populations and then also the indirect impacts of this exploitation. And by that I mean the community level consequences of exploitation on sharks. So consequences that can arise through altered predator and prey interactions. So out of all the different uh, marine fishes that there are in the world, and there are thousands of them, why focus on sharks? Ooh, first I want to show you the species. Let's do that first. Let's look at some pictures. Okay, so there are about, um, uh, 400 different uh, uh, species of sharks. Um, the research that I do has really focused on a group of about 20 of the largest uh, shark species. These include species that are uh, categorized as large coastal species, so it includes uh, the hammerheads, uh, tiger sharks, sandbars, and dusky sharks, as well as the great white shark, which is really the iconic shark from Jaws that everyone will be familiar with. And then it also includes the truly oceanic species like the blue shark, uh, the pressure sharks, Oceanic white tip and mango sharks. So these are really the ocean's apex and near apex predators. And so rather than having to keep repeating apex and near apex, 
I'm going to refer to them throughout the talk as the great sharks. And so usually if I'm speaking in front of a whole um, crowd of shark biologists, and here I just have to apologize to Viz, because I usually tell people that I just refer to them as the great sharks because they're the largest species. But the truth is really that I think these are obviously the greatest sharks in the ocean because they're clearly the coolest uh, animals out there. <laughs> okay, so as I was saying, out of all the different marine fishes that there are in the ocean, why track abundances of these particular species? And that's because this particular group has a really high risk of overexploitation, And that's for a couple of different reasons. First of all, the life history characteristics of many of these species render them fairly um, in, um, vulnerable to overexploitation. And so just to very quickly just with me, overview uh, some of their most pertinent life history characteristics, these are really big sharks, as you uh, probably already know. They can reach a really large uh, maximum size between 3 and 7 meters. And yet they have fairly low fecundity, so small litters. And most importantly, a lot of them tend to take quite a long time to reach sexual maturity, so some up to a couple of decades. And so you're also probably noticing that there's a fair amount of variability amongst these life history characteristics. <clears throat> and so while well, some species, for instance, like the blue shark and the tiger shark, really can keep pace in terms of their productivity with other marine, uh, or with marine teleos fishes, at the other end of the spectrum, we have species like the dusky shark, short fin mako, great white, and scalloped hammerhead, which really are very vulnerable to overexploitation, much more so than marine teleos fishes. Secondly, there's been substantial increases in exploitation of these species in recent decades, despite them being so vulnerable. And a lot of this has been due to escalating demand for shark fins, which are now one of the most highly valuable marine commodities globally. And yet, despite this really high risk of overexploitation, data to examine changes um, in shark populations are really limited globally. And one of the factors that I think contributes to this is that we have really vast geographic ranges. So if we look here at the range, this is for one of the oceanic species, the short fin mako. Its range here is uh, shown in pink. And you can see that it's ranging uh, circum globally. It's crossing many different national and international boundaries, which really greatly complicates management. And even in the Northwest Atlantic, the area that I focus on, this is a huge area to try and sample over and get uh, measures for the populations. Okay. okay. Secondly, a lot of shark catches are actually incidental. So they're taken as bycatch. And this, coupled with the fact that formerly they had very low commercial value, means that over the years, their catches have been quite poorly monitored. And so what we end up with altogether really is a lack of species-specific data for sharks, very few long-term time series uh, data sets, and very few research surveys for these species, particularly for the oceanic sharks. So within this context of high risk and data limitation, the two major questions that I have asked in my research program are, first of all, how have great shark populations uh, changed over time? And if great shark populations themselves are in hot water, are there ecosystem consequences, more broadly, of depleting these oceanic predators? So at the population level, I focused in the Northwest Atlantic specifically because that is one of the very few data-rich regions for these species. And so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time detailing for you my research there, trying to quantify the magnitude of change in those populations. And then I'll just briefly look at what we need to know about the global status of the great sharks. And then at the ecosystem level, I'll highlight for you the uh, research that we did trying to examine through our cascading effects of great shark depletions. Stepping back from sharks a little bit, I'll review the ev evidence overall for top-down control in the ocean. And then because these two community level um, change studies that I'm going to be talking about really focus on structural changes in communities, so changes to abundance and biomass, I want to just take a little bit of time to speculate about how else predator losses might be altering ecosystems. And then I'll finish everything up by just briefly um, overviewing for you my current research program on Central Pacific reefs, which addresses these two uh, overarching research questions. Okay, so starting with the Northwest Atlantic, how have great shark populations changed there in recent decades? Well, to start getting at this question, uh, I began by looking at fisheries data. So I started with fisheries data for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
fisheries data um, spans or can span really large geographic areas. So in this case, this is the effort data from the U.S. Atlantic Pelagic Longline Fishery as reported in log books between 1986 and 2000, so a 15-year period. And the effort clearly spans a really large area. So it goes all the way from offshore of the Grand Banks down the U.S. East Coast into the Gulf of Mexico and all the way down to South America. And it's divided into nine different uh, management units. Um, this fishery is actually uh, targeting swordfishes and tunas, but it's taking sharks as its major bycatch, so it's still catching a lot of these species. Um, and at the time of our analysis, this is the largest uh, data set sampling sharks in this region. It comprised almost a quarter of a million uh, longline sets and over 100 million hooks in the water. So pretty big sample size, um, which made it uh, nice to analyze. Okay, so to analyze these data, I used uh, generalized linear models, and basically standardized for a series of covariates, including year, area, season, um, several different variables pertaining to the fishing operation itself and hooks. Okay, the goal here obviously is to obtain an index of abundance, and this is great because I don't need to explain catch rate standardization to this crowd. Um, okay, so I just want to basically put this up. I know you guys are all familiar with this, but just because this is basically um, you know, sort of the underlying concept behind all of the relative abundance indices that I'm going to show you today. What was uh, new about the approach that we took in this particular analysis is that because the data were recorded by fishermen, we didn't want to make the assumption that they were always going to be writing down sharks, which were a bycatch. So we realized that we actually had two types of data, uh, zeros in the data. We had true zeros, where they went out and actually didn't catch any sharks and wrote down a zero, and other cases where they went out and caught sharks and still wrote down zero because they weren't reporting sharks. So because of this, we um, basically chose to exclude the zeros from the analysis and assume that the error distribution followed a zero truncated negative binomial. So when we apply these models to all of the different uh, shark species, what do we find? We found evidence of regional scale shark decline. So here what you have is the estimated annual percent change for the different coastal species on the top row and the different oceanic species on the bottom row. What you have plotted here are the estimates for each of the nine different areas. Those are the white circles that you see in each panel. And then the uh, oops, open circles um, on the far right hand side of each panel are the overall estimate. So the dashed line along the zero would indicate no change in abundance, and all the points below are indicating declines. So these uh, data and models are basically suggesting that across all of these different shark species, uh, all of them were declining in almost every area. And when we combine these data overall, we see that the overall trend shows substantial declines over just this short period. So the overall trend is the solid line that you see for each species. The individual year estimates are the white squares with their 95% confidence intervals. And you can see that all of the species were declining. So one that might be jumping out at you is uh, white shark. Okay, so you can probably see that those estimates don't look as good as um, they do for the other species. And that's because, or at least we think it's because the white shark was much less frequently than any of the other sharks. So only 6,000 white sharks in the entire data set in comparison to something like the blue shark where over a million blue sharks were reported. So not very surprising that we get less precise estimates for that species. But overall, we have decline estimates ranging from a minimum of 40% in the mako sharks all the way up to 89% for hammerheads. Okay, so pretty uh, substantial, strong declines. But how robust are these results, really? This is just one model type applied to these data. So to examine the robustness, I conducted uh, six different analyses for each species using two different statistical distributions and three different assumptions about shark reporting rates. And so what you see here in this panel, again, crystals on top, oceanics on the bottom. This, again, is the estimated annual percent change. But now on the uh, x-axis, instead of area, these are seven different model types. So the results that I just presented to you are model one, so they're on the left-hand uh, part of each panel. And then you've got the six additional uh, amount, uh, model types that I applied. So again, the zero dashed line would indicate no, um, no change, and you can see that all of the points are below that. So basically what I want to show you is that any way you select these data, any way you look at it, they're um, indicating really substantial declines for all of these. 
Okay. So the next question that I wanted to ask was, well, what happened in earlier decades? We know that fishery didn't just start in 1986. That just happened to be when they started recording sharks. So unfortunately, there are no fishery data that we know of from prior to that time. But one uh, early source of data comes from exploratory long line surveys. And these were conducted on the US East Coast uh, in the 1950s. They were run by the predecessor of NIMS, the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries. And the point of these surveys was essentially to figure out if it would be viable to run commercially uh, commercial tuna fisheries on the U.S. East Coast. So they were going out basically trying to figure out how to fish for tuna. Okay, and they were fishing for a uh, yellowfin tuna, and they caught a lot of yellowfin tuna, but unfortunately a lot of them came up looking like this, pretty much eaten by sharks. So I don't know if you can see the um, horrified look on the scientist's face. <laughs> he is not happy about this. So a lot of them were sharks damaged, and then they were also catching a lot of sharks. So they caught a lot of oceanic white tips, silky and dusky sharks. And scientists remarked that all of those shark species were numerous enough that they could cause serious problems for tuna fisheries. So they actually thought they might not be able to have tuna fisheries because there were so many damn sharks. Okay, so, oh, let's go back. So the approach that I took then, we had this snapshot of data from the 1950s and then this big gap. So I compared those 1950s data to 1990s fisheries data. Okay, so obviously the validity of such a comparison has really been a rest upon, well, how comparable are, are those who got this survey? The survey was really acting like a fishery, not that they were trying to be a fishery. And then you got these fisheries data. So out of all the different surveys that they did, I focused specifically on the ones that were conducted in the Gulf of Mexico. Because those surveys were uh, had the same target species, yellowfin tuna. They fish generally in the same areas, had that fish uh, year round, so we get them at all seasons, and they had the most similar gear. So when we look at those data, I'm just going to show you the catch rates from the 1950s surveys. This is for oceanic white tip shark. This was the most commonly caught uh, shark in the 1950s. It was also the second most commonly caught fish overall in the surface, just right behind the targeted yellowfin tuna. And so you can see the areas of high catches are in red. Uh, they range down to areas of low catches in the very cool colors. And then there are some open hexagons. Those are areas where they didn't catch any oceanic whiteness. You can see there are a lot of areas of high catches. This is a stark comparison. This is really catchy. Uh, this is a stark comparison to the catches that we see for the 1990s from the 50s. So there you can see that most of the hexagons are open indicating no oceanic white tips. When we look across uh, all species, these are arranged from most to least common, we can see that there are really big differences between the 1950s catch rates, which are shown on the left in the orange bars, compared to the 1990s catch rates, which are shown on the right in the yellow bars. And if you're having trouble seeing those yellow bars, it's because they're so small because they were catching so few sharks by the 1990s. Model estimates for these data, again, estimates of substantial uh, declines for these species, a minimum, again, of 45% for mako sharks, all the way up to over 99% for oceanic white tips. So the data that we've analyzed so far really is indicating pretty uh, significant and rapid declines for these species. So perhaps not surprisingly at this point, um, some shark biologists got together and made it very clear to us that they just didn't believe us because it just isn't possible that we could lose oceanic predators this quickly and that they wouldn't have known about it. So perhaps it was just the nature of our analyses, or perhaps it was the data, and that really what we needed to be doing was look at, looking at research surveys, and that would tell us the truth. So we aimed to compile all long-term research surveys from along the U.S. East Coast. We set two criteria they had to have started prior to 1990 because we wanted to look at long-term trends and it had to have um, lasted for more than a decade. So in total, we com um, compiled 17 different research surveys. Uh, these came from uh, state agencies and federal agencies. Uh, one came from a filing cabinet uh, that had never been entered into a computer or analyzed before, so we found them all over the place. Um, the location of the surveys, that's what you can see, these are the different uh, surveys running up the coast. So they're all uh, much more spatially confined than the fisheries data, but the 17 surveys all together do span the entire U.S. <coughs> so together, you, you kind of get a fairly good spatial coverage. So a caveat about these data is that a lot of the surveys actually really weren't of much use for the great sharks, and that's because they certainly weren't designed to be catching these large oceanic predators. 
Um, but I do want you to keep this map and these surveys in mind, because I'm going to come back and talk about all of them a little bit later in the talk. The survey that was of most use uh, for the Great Sharks was one that I'll refer to as the UNC survey because it was conducted at the University of North Carolina. This is the one that we uh, dug up from a file and tablet. And remarkably, it's actually the longest shark targeted survey uh, that we know of conducted on the US East Coast. It's been conducted every single year since 1972. It comprises hundreds of long line sets and have never been analyzed. It's like a dream come true for some Okay. So what did this shark targeted survey show us? It showed precipitous declines in all of the great sharks that hit its sample. So it sampled eight different species. What I'm showing you here are the trends in relative abundance for the six most commonly caught of those uh, species. And what we found was that in general, these trend estimates exceeded the declines that we had estimated from the fisheries data. So all of them exceeded 85% since 1972. And the estimates for bull and dusky sharks were over 98% of that. So really large, large changes. We combined estimates from this survey with all of the other surveys uh, that had caught a species in a random effects meta-analysis. And so what you see here are the uh, meta-analytic estimates for, from the research surveys. Those are um, in the white squares on the top. The estimates that we had uh, before from the fisheries data are uh, the triangles on the bottom. The number of data sets going into each estimate is shown uh, on the right. And again, zero lines <coughs> indicate no change. All the points to the right of the line would indicate increases, but as you can see, there are none. So when we look across a variety of different uh, data types, data sources, and apply a variety of different uh, data model or types of models to them, we can see that the weight of evidence is pretty consistently um, consistent, that there have been significant and rapid declines in the great sharks. Okay, so that's what we know so far from the Northwest Atlantic. Um, but I'm going to just briefly talk about what is the global status of great sharks and what do we know about that? Because the conservation concerns and data challenges that I discussed at the beginning of the talk really pertain um, or ring particularly true for other areas of the world. So really the best uh, way of overviewing the global status of great sharks is from the IUCN Red List. And so I'm just going to briefly uh, review the categories and criteria for the Red List. There are five different criteria uh, that's shown here on the left. I've highlighted A, rapid population decline, because that's the criteria that um, sharks are usually assessed against. And then we have um, the different categories shown here in this uh, ladder of extinction or sort of stairway to heaven. <laughs> where we've got different categories here beginning at the bottom with uh, lower risk, least concern, uh, lower risk, near threatened, and three different threatened categories, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. And I don't know if that was showing under uh, extinct in the wild. And then they sort of like fly off into the ether um, extinct. So hopefully they don't make it that far. Okay, so the IUCN shark specialist group has um, taken it upon itself to do assessments for all chondrocutaneous fishes. So these are sharks and their relatives. It's a group of about 1,200 different uh, marine fishes. And this is going to be one of the first uh, complete group of marine fishes assessed on the IUCN Red List. So, so far, um, I think almost all of the great sharks have been assessed at this point. And what we find is that over half of them fall into these threatened categories, including two species, the scalloped hammerhead and great hammerhead that have now been listed as endangered and nine other species that are listed as vulnerable. Okay, so how does this compare to the overall group of chondrocleon fishes? So to date, uh, 998 uh, assessments have been done for chondrocleon, so almost 1,000 basically. And what we can see is that just over 150 fall into the three threatened categories, which is about 15% of all of them. So you can see that the great sharks tend to be uh, more threatened than the rest of chondrocleon fishes in general. But you might notice that this list actually only adds up to 510. And I said there were 998 assessments. So where are all the rest of them? Unfortunately, they're down here in the data deficient group, 49% of them. So really underscoring the fact that we really face serious data limitations for this group when we start looking beyond data rich regions like the Northwest Atlantic. And just to further illustrate this point with a few other facts, when we look at the FAO, uh, catch database, we see that in recent years, 139 different countries have been reporting chondrocleon catches. We know that the catches have been uh, increasing a lot since 1950, and so 
On the one hand, it's great that countries are reporting their catches, but what we find is that just over half of those countries even dis distinguish between whether they're catching sharks or whether they're catching skates and rakes. So the taxonomic resolution is not great. And fewer than half report any of their Canadian uh, caches at the species-specific level. So this is a big problem, particularly when you consider that those countries not reporting species-specific catches include five of the top ten shark-catching nations. Anyone want to take a guess? Who are the bad? Who are the big fisheries baddies? No one's going to Japan. 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 Research surveys, and we don't even know what species they're catching. Okay, so I'll leave you on that somewhat depressing note for the population level stuff. Okay, well, having established at least for the Northwest Atlantic that we're rapidly losing these apex predators, the next question that I wanted to try and understand was might there be broader ecosystem consequences of these uh, depletions? <coughs> Foremost from uh, Bob Payne's pioneering work here um, at UW in the, in the Rocky Indoor Tile, that predators can be really important determinants of community structure and function. And Bob obviously coined the term trophic cascade um, to describe top down control over three different trophic levels. So, one of the classic examples of a trophic cascade um, comes also from the West Coast, um, from the work of Jim Estes and colleagues, where over decades they have documented the fact that the predators, um, the sea otters, directly control their prey species, the sea urchins, thereby indirectly facilitating the growth of kelp forests, the primary producers. But top-down control can also occur at higher trophic levels. And when it involves the depletion of an apex predator followed by increases in a smaller predator, which is its prey, it's referred to as a mesopredator release. So a really nice example of this comes from uh, San Diego County, uh, where I was recently living, doing my first postdoc, um, it's a study by Kirks and Sule in which they showed that the uh, predator, the coyotes, um, native sage scrub habitat was really uh, drastically reduced as San Diego uh, urbanized. And basically its habitat was reduced to these small remnant canyon areas. And in response, both native and exotic predators, uh, raccoons and cats and other species, increased in abundance. So we wanted to know, might there be similar cascading effects of shark depletions? So this is a question which has really been, I would say, wide open because it's difficult to have enough data to try and examine it. Um, one study that has attempted to get at this um, is through ecosystem modeling. So Jim Kitchell and Carl Walters have uh, built models of the Central North Pacific along with Tim. And in it, they looked at changes that might arise if you depleted sharks. And they basically showed that, well, there probably wouldn't be cascading effects if you depleted sharks. And they concluded that that was the case because if you increase sharks, other predators like tuna probably can come along and compensate for that loss predation, at least on the teleos fishes that they share as prey species. So this is basically what we ex would expect. In a really complex marine food web where you have functional redundancy, you would hope that other species will be able to compensate. And so it's easy to kind of visualize that if we just take a look at a cartoon image of a marine food web. Um, I've scared people a lot in talks. I'm sure I won't scare this crowd, but people sometimes get scared when we put up diagrams like this. So this is a depiction of the US uh, Northeastern Continental Shelf food web. I'm using it just as an example to illustrate the complexity of marine food webs. You've got the two uh, major groups of primary producers, um, the benthic and uh, planktonic producers, and then different species groups ranging all the way up to the upper trophic levels. And you can see really that you've got a lot of different species, You've got a lot of connectants, presumably a high functional redundancy. You've got a lot of omnivory and trivial predation. So when you look at all of this, it's not hard to imagine that if one particular species group here was depleted through fishing, you might not see a lot of changes in the system. And that really stands in stark contrast to the really simple linear food chains 
um, from the classic powerful examples of trophic cascades like the sea otter urchin one. Okay, so we realized that if out of this a big mess like this we were going to detect cascading effects of shark depletions, the key would be to focus on the strong interactors in the system. And so specifically focusing on those prey species for which the great sharks were the major source of predation. Okay, so what species are those? Those are smaller sharks, skates, and rakes, because the great sharks are really the major predators on this group of, of species. So here we have documented dietary links from the literature for those great shark species on the elasmobranch brain these are predators. And we hypothesized that as the great sharks declined, these mesopredators would probably be released from most of their predation, predator, uh, predation pressure and might therefore increase in abundance. So when we looked at those research surveys, all of the uh, 17 from the ones that I showed you on the map from along the U.S. East Coast before, what we found indeed were increases in these mesopredators. So individual research surveys, for example, uh, for smooth butterfly ray, little skate, Atlantic sharp nose shark, and chain cat shark all indicated that these particular species had increased by about an order of magnitude. And when we combined estimates from all the research surveys for each species, again, that analytically, what we found is basically something that looks like the mirror image of the plot that I showed you before for the great sharks. We're now, instead of all the species decreasing, 12 out of 14 of them were increasing. So again, we've got the meta-analytics in the white squares, the number of data sets going into each estimate along the right, and you can see that it's a very different picture. So fairly strong evidence of increases in these mesopredators. predators. One of these species, uh, the Cadmose gray, was among the most greatly increasing of the mesopredators. predators. It was also uh, among the best sampled because it was uh, surveyed in seven of the different uh, surveys. It's also my personal nominee for the ugliest out of all of them. <laughs> And it's the most conspicuous, probably, of them because it travels really close to the inshore when it's migrating up and down the U.S. East Coast. And it can do so in these really um, large schools, pretty tightly packed in when you see in this photo. Okay, so to examine uh, the lower half of the food web, we were really fortunate to be able to team up with colleagues at the University of North Carolina, um, including uh, Pete Peterson and Sean Powers. And they had really fortuitously been studying Hanno's rays and their prey species um, since the early 80s. Very lucky one. Okay, so what we think is going on here is that collectively the hyperabundant Hanno's ray population is probably feeding on a large number of bivalves, and in particular bay scallops, which are preferred prey in this particular region. And so over the past two decades, an apparent trophic cascade has emerged in that as the great sharks declined, Hanno's rays increased in abundance, and in response, bay scallop populations in North Carolina, which was one of the last areas that had a healthy uh, bay scallop population, uh, collapsed, taking with it a century-long commercial bay scallop fishery. Okay, so why do we think that Hanno's rays would have caused a bay scallop collapse? What evidence is there? Well, first of all, um, Pete Peterson and colleagues very nicely went out in the early 1980s and, and sampled the scallop mortality, both before and after the rays had migrated through the area. And what they found in the early 80s was very low mortality. So this is percent-based scallop mortality, and you can see that it's pretty low, which is what we would expect because at that point, the town was great population was still fairly low. In contrast, when they went back by 1992 and started sampling, they found something very different. That every year since then, they found almost complete base scallop mortality at precisely the time the counters rays are migrating through the area. Secondly, controlled uh, experiments were conducted in seven different uh, inshore areas of North Carolina up here. So this is the larger area shown here. Um, I'm just going to orient you, first of all, to this figure. So the arrows that you see are the migratory pathway of the counters rays through the area. The seven different areas where the experiment was set up are the uh, red circles, and there's a corresponding um, bar plot with results for each one. Okay, so the way the experiment worked is quite, quite simple. I love these really elegant ecological experiments. They um, set up countless ray ex exposures. So they basically established vertical poles in the water spaced in an array. No netting on it or anything. The base gallops were inside the poles, so they were protected. Other predators could come in and eat the base gallops, no problem. The only thing really that couldn't get in were the cow-nose rays because they couldn't make it through uh, with their large wingspan, and they never figured out that if they could actually just 
heard slightly, but you probably would get them, so not, not so smart. Okay, so a really simple, uh, elegant, but effective experiment. So what they found was that on the unprotected rounds, that's what you see in the black uh, bars for each history. So in the black bars from the, uh, the 1990s onwards, there was a really high base scallop mortality. So if you look, for instance, at the straits, in 2002, there was 100% mortality on the unprotected rounds. 2003, about 80% mortality on the unprotected rounds. In contrast, the hatch bars is the base style of mortality inside those exposures. And you can see that in every area, it was a lot lower sometimes. Yes, there was no mortality inside. So pretty strong um, experimental evidence that base scallops were directly causing, causing this change. Okay, so we put together all of the different pieces. We have a couple, couple different um, pieces of evidence that suggest that there have been large food web, web changes apparently stemming from declines in great sharks. First of all, mesopredator release in that a lot of their um, elasmobranch prey species increased in abundance following their declines. And then secondly, a trophic cascade in that these changes um, went all the way from countless rays down to impact their prey species, the base scallops. Okay. So I think in some ways this is a really nice illustration of how um, the nature of human disturbances can really alter what we might otherwise predict from ecological theory. So ecological theory would tell us that we shouldn't expect these types of cascading effects in food, marine food webs because they're so complex and there's so much functional redundancy. But the nature of industrial fisheries is such that those fisheries can actually affect whole functional groups of predators, so thereby removing whole sources of predation and basically leaving no other um, predators intact to make up for that. So they're basically eradicating the functional redundancy in the system. So clearly, if we want to understand what's going on in these systems, I think we need to take into account the nature of anthropogenic disturbances today. Okay. Clearly, as you all know, sharks aren't the only uh, marine fish, and they're certainly not the only ones that have been declining. So I then wanted to take a step back and ask, well, what's the general evidence of top-down control in the ocean? And certainly, the established paradigm has been that oceanic ecosystems are driven from the bottom up. And throughout the whole last century, I would say that the evidence certainly supported that paradigm. Um, when I look back, I can find only two examples, um, one of them a pretty weak example, of top-down control in the ocean. So really, all of the literature uh, was providing evidence of bottom-up control. But when I reviewed the literature from the last decade, I found 29 different case studies providing evidence for top-down control in the ocean. Okay, so why has the evidence suddenly exploded? Where is this all coming from? I think partly it might be the interest of researchers, but a major factor I think is simply data availability. Our time series are getting longer, we're collecting more data, and suddenly we can start to test these really difficult um, questions. So another uh, interesting aspect of this is that rather than uh, simply examining a single predator time series and a single prey time series and saying, oh great, there's a negative correlation, it's which is really you know, kind of akin to doing an experiment where you've got one treatment and one replicate, so not to be, not to be advised. Instead, now there's a lot more data and people are being able to uh, employ more comparative approaches where they can look at multiple predator and prey populations from many different areas. And really, this is allowing people to make stronger inferences about what's going on in these ecosystems. So what are we learning from these studies? First of all, I think we're seeing that the evidence is emerging from a lot of different geographic areas. So there were studies coming out from the Baltic, the Black Sea, the Northeast Pacific, Northwest Atlantic, Antarctica, so a lot of different areas. There's also evidence of this stemming, certainly not just from the great sharks, but from many different marine mammal predators and a whole suite of uh, marine teleops fishes. So to me, this uh, part is important because it indicates that top-down control in the ocean isn't just limited to one particular area or one, one different type of predatory taxa. Um, what we are seeing, however, is that a lot of the evidence really just involved mesopredator release. So that is, it's happening across two different trophic levels, generally between piscivorous fishes and plantivorous fishes. And so we're not seeing very many examples of trophic cascades in the ocean, at least, at least yet. Yeah, maybe it's a data problem, but maybe they're not really occurring. 
And so the ecologist Gary Polis would term these sort of limited cascades as species level cascades rather than community level cascades. And because he would say they're not actually causing huge ecosystem transformation and that they're only involving a couple different trophic levels, so they're probably not really that important. And that may be true if you're looking at, I don't know, small insects in a grassland and you don't really care if these species are affected, but I would certainly contend that in the ocean, even if just a few species are affected, this is probably fairly important, particularly if multiple species, um, even if they're just at two trophic levels, are affected. We probably care about this, even just from a socioeconomic standpoint. We care because it's probably going to affect fisheries yields or the commercial value of fisheries. And certainly I would say that we all, even people who aren't fishery scientists, we all care about whether or not we get to eat tuna fish versus jellyfish on our dinner plate or cod versus herring. So I think that we do care about these changes. Okay, but apart from changes to yield or potential sources from yield, why else might we care about uh, top-down control in the ocean? Why else might we care about what uh, else predators might be doing in the ocean? And can we really afford to be depleting uh, marine predators as much as we do through industrial fishing? Okay, so this is where I um, get beyond the data and hopefully get to express um, an opinion and speculate a bit, which I think was part of the instructions for the Bowen. Okay. Well, one reason that predators might be important in ecosystems is because they might be able to promote community st stability. And they might do that through uh, prey switching as resource availability changes. So I just want to highlight this study. Um, it's by Neil Rooney and Kevin McCann, uh, who are based at the University of Guelph. Because I think they've been doing some really interesting work to try and explain the mechanisms underlying um, stability in ecosystems. This is from their 2006 paper, in which they propose that ecosystems are composed of distinct energy channels. So in the ocean, you can think about there being a benthic energy channel and a pelagic energy channel. These energy channels are operating at different speeds, so fast and slow, and that they have asynchronous input of carbon into the system. And what they're proposing is that top predators couple these distinct energy channels and that they also have the ability to rapidly switch between them as resource densities differ in them. So this is really, I think, one of my favorite papers from the past five years. And um, any grad students that haven't read it, I would strongly encourage you to. I think, it's, um, I think these guys are really uh, doing some very interesting work on food webs and stability. Okay, so if, however, fishery scientists can really well predict uh, how marine populations are going to change, then why would we need to worry about what predators are doing? Why would we need to worry about keeping predators around so that they can promote stability? And why would we need to worry about what other functions they might be playing in the ecosystem? And I would say that we need to worry about all of these things because fisheries aren't the only game in town. Oceanic ecosystems are subject to a whole host of different anthropogenic disturbances today. This map is from California and Colley's recent paper uh, where they documented different human activities around the world. So this map is basically showing you the intensity of human activities in the world's oceans. And what they concluded was that every square kilometer of the world's oceans now has some sort of human disturbance in it. And that 40% of the world's ocean area has multiple human disturbances in it. So, there's a lot of uh, anthropogenic disturbance going on here. So out of all of these different um, disturbances, I would say in particular that climate change is probably increasing the variability of natural ecosystems. And so it seems plausible to me to think that if top predators can confer stability, that, that might be fairly important and that they might be able to buffer against some of this climate change variability. So there haven't been very many studies that have been able to examine this yet. But one that has uh, is one by uh, Wilmers and Getz, where they looked at Yellowstone Park. They a really nice um, empirical and modeling study. And what they proposed for Yellowstone is that prior to wolf reintroduction, so when there were no wolves in the park, at that time, uh, weather-related winter elk mortality was a really important source of elk for scavengers, so scavengers like eagles, ravens, and bears. Over the past half century, as uh, winters started getting a little bit milder and a little bit more variable, elk mortality.
fall, the baby started varying and started to be less and less elk mortality over the winter. And what this uh, resulted in was basically a food bottleneck for those scavengers. Once wolves were reintroduced to the park, they became the dominant source of elk mortality in the park, and they provided a staple source of elk mortality year-round for those scavengers, thereby basically dampening the weather-related variability in elk availability. So, you know, put this out there basically as, I think, a really interesting natural history story, and also maybe a, what I think is a tantalizing example of how predators might be able to provide insurance against Okay, overall, given the reality that we're now facing of multiple stressors in the ocean, I think we're at the point, or at least rapidly approaching the point, where we're no longer going to be able to predict how one disturbance impacts populations or ecosystems without taking into account what the other uh, disturbances are doing in the system and how they're um, possibly feeding back from one another. So if we think about climate change, climate change is almost certainly affecting uh, fisheries, or it's going to be affecting all of our fisheries, either through alterations to primate productivity or altered uh, distributions of the fish species themselves. But I think conversely, we can also think about the fact that fisheries impacts, particularly through removal of predators, might be altering the resilience of those ecosystems to climate change. And I think that's one that we don't think about that often. Okay. So I think that really trying to understand how multiple stressors, and I'm particularly focusing on fisheries and climate change, how that they are interacting in the ocean, how they're affecting our oceanic ecosystems, is a, sort of a really open, new area. There are a lot of questions uh, that are unanswered here, particularly with respect to what the ecological role of predators are in these ecosystems. And so to me, this is sort of an area uh, ripe for inquiry that I think we can all hopefully jump into and start trying to understand what's going on here. So I'm going to uh, finish by overviewing uh, my current research program and the approaches that I'm taking to try and address some of these questions. So at the population, trying to address um, changes in shark populations that are occurring in a much more uh, data poor situation than in the Northwest Atlantic. And at the ecosystem level, trying to answer some of the questions that I've just, just been outlining about uh, the ecological role of predators and how uh, they might interact uh, with climate change stressors. So this research is focused on Central Pacific reefs. Um, and reefs, I think, are particularly, well, first of all, they're particularly amenable to getting to go and doing nice field work. Um, but that's not what I put in the grant. Um, they're particularly amenable to studying some of these ecosystem questions, because you can go out and hopefully get measures for the entire ecosystem. And if we're really lucky, we can get measures from many different reefs. So at the population level, the approach I'm taking is to um, uh, do large-scale empirical analyses of data from many different reefs. These are reefs across the Central Pacific. Uh, you can uh, see them outlined here, the Marianas, Pacific or North Island areas, American Samoa, and the Hawaiian Islands. So this is data from um, an ecosystem monitoring program that NOAA's Coral Reef Ecosystem Division has been conducting since 2001 surveying all of these different reefs. And so over the past two years, I've been uh, building a collaboration with these researchers. And some of the first questions that I'm starting to ask are about why reef predators, and particularly reef sharks, are distributed where they are distributed. So at NCs, I'm going to be building species distribution models. And the underlying principle here is to take the observed distributions from the surveys that they've done and to try and establish a statistical relationship between them and other factors, for example, oceanographic and anthropogenic factors, and then to use that established relationship to try and predict the distribution of these species beyond the sampled areas. So in this case, to reefs across the entire Pacific. Um, this approach has been really commonly used in terrestrial ecosystems, particularly trying to predict how um, different species will shift with climate change, but it hasn't been employed um, that often in the ocean. So one of the things that I'm hoping that we'll be able to do if we actually end up with a fairly good predictive capacity from these models is to hind cast the models so that we can actually try and estimate past occurrences and abundances of reef predators. And this, I think, is important because we have no time series data for any of these species. So we really have very little understanding, first of all, why they are where they are and if their abundances have changed over time. 
And then finally, hopefully we'll be able to forecast extinction risk in Pacific reef shark populations um, because they are rapidly coming under uh, pushing pressure for their fins from distant water fleets. At the ecosystem level, um, I've initiated a research, field research program on Christmas Island uh, with Sheila Walsh at Brown University, um, whose expertise is in socioeconomics of coral reef communities. And I just want to first orient you to uh, Christmas Island. It is up here in the Northern Line Islands group. This is about 1,200 miles uh, south of Honolulu, so basically right in the middle of nowhere. It is part of the Republic of Kiribati, which has uh, the Northern Line Islands group, Southern Line Islands group, uh, Phoenix Islands, which you may have heard of because they were recently designated as the Phoenix Islands protected area, and then also the Gilbert Islands. And then just to orient you uh, to the pronunciation, this is the Gilbert T's pronunciation, where your T's become S's, so it's pure loss and Christmas. Christmas uh, is the largest atoll in the world in terms of land mass, and it's providing us with a really nice natural experiment in that there's a really strong oceanographic gradient across the atoll, and there's also a really strong disturbance gradient. So we can start to try and tease apart the effects of predators and oceanography, which is really nice to be able to do. So to try and get at this, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, another reason that we're particularly interested in this island um, is because human impacts on it are really set to intensify because the government of the Republic of Kiribati has decided to relocate a lot of the country's population to this atoll. And so they have a plan to increase human population on the island by 300% in the next 15 years, which is pretty huge. So we want to be around for that to see um, how the uh, ecology and the human welfare aspects on this island change. And so to try and get at this, um, we've initiated a socioeconomic monitoring program, as well as an ecological monitoring program where we're uh, monitoring uh, all the fishes, the invertebrates, as well as the benthos from coral settlement tiles and photoquads. And so with these types of uh, data, we'll be able to ask questions like, are climate change impacts such as bleaching um, less at the remote end of the island where you've got an intact food web as opposed to in the really heavily disturbed end of the island? We're also going to be doing predation and grazing rate assays across the disturbance gradient. And then uh, completing, hopefully this year, a stable isotope study to try and reconstruct the food web and hopefully be able to answer some of those uh, questions that Rene and McCann have been posing about if top predators are indeed coupling energy channels on these reefs. And then we're also going to be able to scale up uh, from this single island study so that we can ask similar questions, hopefully at reefs uh, across the Pacific, or at least for these really remote reefs, so in the Southern Line Islands, and uh, Phoenix Islands group working with Schmidt Research Vessel Institute. Um, we're going to be conducting uh, cruises to these areas in 2011 and hopefully be able to get a better handle on what the ecological role of predators is, uh, how climate change resilience uh, changes across these islands. And the idea here really is so that we can start getting a better understanding of variability in ecosystem function and resilience. Okay. So I'm going to finish by uh, just overviewing some of the broad implications uh, of my research that I hope I've convinced you of today. And the first is that I would say sharks do appear to be in hot water. We've documented uh, significant and rapid declines, at least for the areas where we have good data. We know that there are a lot of uh, data deficiencies in other areas where there's still intense exploitation and that may be cause for even greater concern. We've also seen that uh, shark depletions can indeed have cascading effects in food webs, and that there appears to be increasing evidence for top-down control in the ocean. I personally think that there's a critical need for us to all start trying to understand how multiple stressors like climate change and exploitation are interacting and impacting oceanic ecosystems. And I hope I've convinced you that uh, ecosystem to global scale studies, uh, the type that I approach, are really going to be necessary if we're going to answer um, critically important questions in ecology and fishery science this century. And so on that note, I'm going to leave you with uh, Bob May's perspective on science, which really is what I uh, try to aspire to in my own research program. And that is that we should resist the temptation to find some problem that can be studied on a convenient scale. But rather, we should strive to identify the important problems 
and then ask what is the proper scale on which to study them, and how might such studies be carried out if the scale is large. from countries that you call the baddies. And I, I, I haven't been directly involved in it that closely in the last couple of years, but I'd like to make two observations and ask you a question. The first observation, maybe there's only one observation, anyway, um, <laughs> an observation, is that the IUCN listings of even the great shocks are way below what you would expect given the results from your study. So your under the criteria A, you would say that most of those species should be listed as critically endangered, which is an 80% threshold, you're way below that. I, I, I asked the question of whether your results, how far have your results gone into that community of shark biologists to the point where, yes, they're saying they're endangered, but endangered is only, quote unquote, a 51% or so reduction in abundance. I, I still question whether you've really got all the way there, and, and hence you really haven't, I think, made that impact in the communities that would really reduce exploitation. Your thoughts? Right. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm also a member of the SSG, and <laughs> so uh, I think that has actually been a really good experience because it put me in a room with a lot of those shark biologists over several um, week-long workshops, and I think just having a lot of time together to get to know each other, um, hopefully dissipated some of the tension. Um, and in terms of the listings, um, I see your point, but what, what actually ends up happening with those listings is that we do population level assessments, and then the assessments that I was presenting, what actually gets accepted by the IUCN are species level assessments. So basically, what we often ended up with were um, you know, really threatened listings from the Northwest Atlantic where we actually had data studies, and then we still have to come up with some sort of listing or criteria or uh, category um, for all of the other different geographic areas where the species is known to exist. So you still have to come up with an assessment for all of these shark species in the Indian Ocean where you, you have no clue what's going on. And so generally what happens in those areas is you sort of maybe you have a couple snippets of data and some expert judgment and you say, well, we know there's fisheries and we know there's catches and we don't have any data, so maybe they're near threat. And basically what ends up, ends up happening at the end of the day is that the species assessment is an averaging of all those population listings. So I guess to answer your question, I think things have gotten through in that we got reasonable listings for those populations where we had the data. Um, but then what happens is you get this averaging and sort of watering down because we have all these other areas that are completely big so. There's also something that they refer to they think it's a secret, I don't know, but they call the uh, shark specialist group clutch factor. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the third, maybe not the only additional shark specialist. <laughs> yeah, okay, who else is in here? Because we all keep um, breathing out of our holes here. Uh, uh, there, uh, there was a considerable amount of controversy and, 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 and somewhat strong feeling about that. But I would say,
I did recommend that you publish because I thought setting up the dialogue was a great thing. <coughs> so I think you guys made a real contribution to that. Even if it's, it's differences, it doesn't make any difference. The issue is how we highlight, highlight these matters. Uh, in your uh, presentation, you mentioned that you If we accept that there's been these uh, huge declines in shark populations and that there are ecosystem consequences of those declines, I'm curious if you have thoughts about potential solutions. Broad diets. 
what are the major sources of predation on prey. It doesn't really matter that the predator can be eating lots of different things, but if it's really the only source of predation on that prey population, then it's going to be able to affect shape, isn't it? And that's basically what we think is going on with those the examples that I was showing you. Well, let's uh, thank uh, Julia again.